Faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain, and for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, but I, I pray that you will be able to appreciate. Uh, this chapter more than you have in the past um, as we study through through this great, great section of Scripture. It says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. The word it there, if you write in your Bibles, circle the word faith, and it, and connect those two words, because that's what it's referring to. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, and whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, 
since she considered him faithful who had promised. Look at the end of verse 10. Abraham was looking by faith for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. If you have read this in the past and assume that he is referring to Jerusalem or the physical promised land, disabuse yourself of that idea. Because this verse here tells us that he was looking for the city, even though he was already in that promised land. Look at verse 9. He still lived in tents. He was not happy in that place because that was not the place that was his. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, and whose architect and builder is God. Now look at verse 12. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as a sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are, a, they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And that word type there is pointing to Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith, he kept the Passover, and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the harlot, did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Oh, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of faith, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And others 
they were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and in holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us. So that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. The word us in this passage is the, uh, is the key word for us to understand this promised land. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It is so impressive how this chapter has been organized by the Holy Spirit. It begins by telling us what faith is, by giving us some impressive examples and illustration of, of, of faith in action by these great men and women. And then as if that weren't enough, by telling us that we are partakers of the same promise that they received, but yet they never did receive it in this life and have not received it yet because they're waiting for something to come as well as we are. And then it ends in chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, as the greatest example of all when it comes to faith the Son of God himself when he died on the cross. There is an interesting connection from the very first one mentioned, Abel, to the last one mentioned, Jesus. And it is what I have often referred to as the scarlet thread of faith. It is that crimson thread of blood that has connected these great men and women of faith and has been uh, unbroken in every single book of the Bible. There is a mention or an illusion somehow one way or the other of the cross until you get to the Gospels. And then after you move on from the Gospels, every single book afterwards, all of the Pauline epistles, all of the uh, 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 epistles written by John and Peter, all those point back to the cross. It is that perfect scarlet thread of the blood of the Lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ that is unbroken to give us that promise that those great men and women of the Old Testament were so looking forward to that will be realized with both of us, both groups, the day that our Lord comes back. I jumped way ahead of myself. Let us get to the beginning of this chapter. Remember that the theme of this entire letter is that we have something better, something better than all religions and something better that even the Jews have. We have a better covenant because a covenant that we have gives us a relationship 
direct relationship with our Father and the ability to be able to say, Abba, Father. We have a better priest. We have a relationship with the Son and not the servant. We have better promises. We have a better religion. And we cannot improve on Christianity because you cannot improve on Christ. And now in this chapter, what is under consideration is a better country a better land, a better place. The Old Testament saints shared in, in, in our faith in the sense that they were also looking for a better country. And as I pointed out as we were doing our reading, that they were not just looking for a physical promised land. As a matter of fact, Abraham never was looking for that physical promised land. Because when he got there, he still lived in a tent. He didn't build a house. The only thing that he owned was a cave wherein he buried his wife. He, as all the other uh, men and women that we read about, were looking beyond Canaan for a new Jerusalem. As we have read, the better thing. And what they never received in their lifetime is what they had faith in. That is, they were hoping they had faith, rather, in, in what was invisible, just like we have the same faith in what is invisible. Now, we'll, we'll see more about this here in the next slide. See, Abraham, when we read that, that bit about Abraham, uh, verses 12 through about 18, and it talks about his son Isaac, says that Abraham believed that his son would, that he was born as good as dead because he believed in the resurrection. But when was the resurrection in the Old Testament? When was it taught to Abraham? See, Abraham could not see the resurrection, but he believed it. Because God said to him, you will have a descendant as large, as great as the stars and the, and the grains of the seashore. And when he was told that he would have a child by Sarah and that that, that that child would be his descendant, he believed that no matter what happened to his son, that God would keep his word. So he believed in something that he had never seen before. And something that had never been explained to him in detail or at all. And that was the resurrection. So Abraham shared with us, shares with us, the same faith because we've never seen the resurrection either. But yet we believe it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection, we are the most to be pitied. Why? Because our entire belief system. Our entire faith rests on the fact that there is a resurrection because we are pilgrims in this world. We are gypsies living in tents and in caves because we are looking for the better land that has been promised to us just as it was promised to these in Hebrews chapter 11. So those before and after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus share in the same faith. John 20, verses 24 to 29, we read about Thomas the Doubter, who said, unless I can see with my own eyes and put my finger in, 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 the, uh, in, in the, um, wounds of where the nails pierce the hands of, of my Lord, I won't believe. Thomas was saying, seeing is believing. And that is a scientific approach, by the way. Whenever you are are studying science and you're doing experiments. One of the main uh, 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 tenets of science is observation. You observe, you write, you, you continue to, to test the hypotheses and the theories. But as, as whenever there's no, nothing to observe, then, that, then there no longer is anything else to do with that experiment or, or in that field. For example, when you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, by faith we understand 
that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And scientists will argue and quibble about the origins of the earth. And they will do so by what they can observe. And they will say that the telescopes and, 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 the, and the gases and all those things in, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere and in, out in the asteroid areas uh, tell them how old the earth is. But what they cannot do is tell us what's beyond that. Because it's no longer observable. But what can the Christian do? We can say that by faith, since it's not something that we obtain by observation, the worlds were created by the word of God. So what is faith? I understand that uh, most, most Christians are quickly to, are quick to quote, the first three passages, three verses of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, when we are asking for the definition of faith. But I want you to think about it this way. Faith is the ability to say that we are pilgrims and aliens, or, or as one commentator uh, says, uh, that we are just gypsies in this world, in a foreign land. This does not belong to us. That, that we are not living in this world with the idea and attitude that I'm staying here forever. Now, there are some Christians that say that they are faithful, that they believe in God, they believe in the afterlife, and that they're looking for heaven and all those things. But their, their, their actions is like that rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, Lord, Master, what shall I do to... Uh, to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says, you know, keep the first two commandments. And he says, I've done that. He said, well, one thing you lack. So all of your possessions and give it to the poor. And he went away with his head hanging low because he possessed many things. And he just couldn't give up his, his, his wealth, his riches, his earthly possessions. And there are many Christians that live that way. They just cannot live as pilgrims and aliens in a foreign land. But true faith is the ability to say, none of this is mine. None of this is forever. All of this is going to be destroyed in the day of judgment. And it's okay. Because I'm looking for something better. For a city whose architect and builder is God. It is being sure of things hoped for. And unfortunately, in our English language, the word hope is not what the Bible or how the Bible uses it. I want you to think from now on when you read the word hope in the Bible as an anchor. It is the anchor of, of assurance. It is that which holds and does not allow anything to move, in this case, us. But it is not like it is used in our English language. You know, I sure hope it, it snows tomorrow if you're a kid. You're hoping it snows tomorrow if you're an adult. You're hoping it doesn't snow. But, but the word hope there, it, it, it already implies this sense of doubt. But not the word hope from the Bible. The word hope from the Bible implies assurance. I am 100% positive because our hope is anchored in God. It is not anchored on what man says. It is not anchored on what the weatherman says. It is anchored on God, on his word. And we know that it is impossible for God to lie and that God cannot swear by any other name because his name is the supreme name. And that God will never change. Look at verse 3. As I already explained that science will argue the origin of, of earth by observation, but faith argues that without observing, we believe that it was created. And every instance in the Bible where God commends the actions of a man or a woman, he commends those people 
who say, I believe now. Not those that say, well, I'll wait and see how things turn out later. They are commended because they have faith without seeing. Because they have faith without having obtained anything. Because they act as if God had already given them what he had promised. Which takes us to the bloodline. To the bloodline of the examples of faith that we read about here. In Hebrews chapter 11. Everyone in this list. Shares the same pedigree. Not that they are all related. That they come from the same family. But they share the same faith. For example. In verse 4. The first one that is mentioned is Abel. If, Abel, if Adam lost his faith. Abel found it. And it says in verse 4 that, that by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than, than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. And notice this, God testified, God commended, God testified about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Now, some might say that the reason that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and, and rejected Cain's sacrifice is because Abel brought God a blood sacrifice and, and Cain brought him a sacrifice of vegetables or fruits or whatever he was growing. Uh, but, but I don't think that really has much merit when you read the scriptures here because it says that one did it by faith while that means that the other one did not do it by faith. So, if we already understand what faith means, the assurance, the conviction, the anchor in God's word, it means that Abel had the faith, the conviction to offer a sacrifice as God said, and that God would be pleased with that sacrifice, but Cain didn't do it that way. One was He was pleased with one and displeased with the other. In verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. He was not found because God took him up, for he obtained witness. He obtained the witness that before uh, that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. If you have read the scriptures long enough, you, you will remember that Enoch was the man who never died. He never went to his grave. Notice the scripture says that he walked with God. It doesn't say that he just lived for God or that he was a good man only, but that he walked with God. What does that mean, that he walked with God? That means that he was always stepping with God. That he was in step with God, that he was in agreement with God, that he, that he believed in God, trusted in him, had the confidence and the assurance that whatever God said, whatever he asked of him, whatever he promised him, that God would deliver. He was one who believed in God and trusted in him. And as a reward, he didn't taste that. Isn't that something? In verse 7, in verse 7, we read about the crazy man who built a ship in the middle of a sandy desert during a time that people had not experienced rain. especially a flood. By faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen. That is an expanded definition of faith, of things not yet seen. Abraham believed in the resurrection. He had never seen it. He had faith that the one that was telling him about the resurrection would come through. 
We have faith in the resurrection because God has told us that that's going to happen. Abraham had faith that, that he would uh, obtain the promised land in heaven, although he died and never received it. We have the same faith of things not yet seen. Noah, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of, of the righteousness which is according to faith. So now notice another part of the faith that pleases God is righteousness. And what is righteousness? Things that make right or things that are right with God. And those that, that have a complete and total dependence and assurance in God are right with God. They are in step with God. They are doing things by faith and not by sight like Abel. And here stands one man in the midst of an entire society of the entire world. Who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people existed then? But here is one man who had enough faith that through and by and because of his faith was able to save his entire household, eight souls. And because of his faith and his conviction, he was able to repopulate the earth by faith. Noah was a man who believed that when God spoke it, it would happen. That settled it. Noah was convinced and he was in the minority. And Peter later on assures us that it was by water then that the world was destroyed. But it will be by fire next time. Now imagine. Imagine your concern if you were as convinced of the second catastrophe as Noah was about the first catastrophe. How concerned would you be about your family? About your friends? About your own soul? If you were as concerned or as convinced about the end of the world that will burn with fire as Noah was convinced about the flood. So much that he set out to build an ark to save his family. And then there's Abraham, the greatest man of faith, human, apart from Jesus. So look at verses 8 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. This is a man that uh, whose, whose relationship, whose faith began at 80 years old. This is when he was called by God to leave Ur of the Chaldees to go to some other place several hundred miles away that he had no idea where he was going. It has been discovered by archaeologists that during the time that Abraham lived in the Ur, in Ur the Chaldees, as they have excavated some, some houses, some dwellings, that these houses had indoor plumbing, that they had a, an air conditioning system built into their homes, that Ur the Chaldees was one of the most modern societies of that time. And Abraham was told to leave that place behind. All the conveniences of, of the modern comforts of his time. To go and become a gypsy. A nomad. Without a compass in his hand. Only the word of God. At the age of 80. 
Most people that I know at 80 aren't making huge relocation plans. And if they are, they have an idea of where they're going to go. But here, Abraham, at age 80, sets out on the promise that God will deliver. This is why I say that he is the greatest example or the greatest man of faith apart from Jesus. Verse 9. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Because he was looking, or for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive. And we should, by this time, know the story. That one day, Abraham, feeling lonely, was sitting outside looking at the stars. And it is said that man can see with the naked eye about 6,000 stars. And that God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a child through Sarah. And your descendants are going to be as great as those stars. Hold up, Abraham. They're going to be as great as the grains of the sands of the seashore. And I'm sure that if you were to fill both hands with sand, it'd be more than 6,000 grains in those hands. When you read in Genesis about, in Genesis uh, chapter 11, you read all those begats. This one begat that one, that one begat this one, this one married this woman, she and they, he and, and that one begat, 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 begat. And then you get to Sarah and it ends, Sarah begat nobody. And we should understand that in that society, if a woman could not begat, if a woman could not conceive, she was useless. She was already a second class citizen to begin with. And if she couldn't, if she could not begat, then she was worse than a second class citizen. It didn't help her self image at all. But we read here in Hebrews 11 that uh, at, at an elderly age, both she and Abraham are told that they will have children or a child. Notice. In Hebrews 11, verse 11. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and the innumerable, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And all of these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, that is, they saw these promises with the eye of faith, and they welcomed them as if they already possessed them because that was how sure they were of God's promises. And they even, they believed so much in the promises of God that they confessed that they were aliens and sojourners in a foreign land. Verse 11, for those who say such things, make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. But it was that child that Abraham and Sarah so, so much desired That in verse 17, God said, I want you to take that son of yours, that only begotten son of yours. I want you to kill him. And Abraham took his son. 
tied them up and put them on an altar and raised that knife to slit his throat. And the angel of the Lord spoke up and said, you have proven your faith to me. And the Lord provided a ram. And that ram was sacrificed. Verse 19, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. We are sharers in the triumphs of faith of these great men and women that we have just spoken about. And the next time we meet, we're going to look at the rest of these people, like Isaiah, who by tradition, is believed that he was sawn uh, uh, sawn in, in, in two. Or Jeremiah, who was placed in quicksand. Or Rahab, the idolatrous prostitute, who had heard about the power of God, and now he had destroyed the Egyptians and the army. How she asked for God to be kind to her and her household. Now Rahab became a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We're going to read about Gideon and study about Barak. And even Jephthah, the one that promised that he would offer as a sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house and his daughter came out. We'll study about David and Samuel. All as illustrations and examples of great men and women of faith. But here is a teaser for you. Look at chapter 12. Chapter 12. And in verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses that are surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. I read this passage and I think of us standing at the, at the starting line to run a race. And all of these great men and women of Hebrews 11 are in the stands. And there is one with the starting gun. And as soon as a trigger is pulled, those great men and women of faith in the stands are cheering us on. And they're telling us, don't stop. Make it to the finish line. Because the promise is not earthly, but heaven. Thank you.